Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we're excited to be back in the affirmations uh, uh, sessions. Uh, I, I want to say thank you to everyone that is taking part of this session, on this session, and also everyone that is following. I see Jack that also will be speaking uh, later in the semester uh, 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 here in one of the sessions. Uh, just for those that are new in affirmations, we're basically trying to affirm here as we interrogate also what are the forms of, uh, what are the ways of being political through and as the disciplines of the built environment? What is the way that that's also a conversation that architects, planners, designers uh, are not having alone, but it's also concerning other fields? And what are the new or the different, the dissident, the, the, the relevant ways of of reacting to the failure and operating in the cracks of modernity and uh, the culture of extractivism, colonialism, ableism, uh, and we could go on, uh, patriarchates, uh, anthropocentrism, uh, and we could add some that we're discussing these days. But basically, there's something that is emerging in these cracks. There's new notions. And we see these sessions as an opportunity also to set or to reset conversations, the conversation of what's the status of the future in design practices, what do we mean by decolonizing uh, architectural practices, what it's the notions of time that are relevant to discuss now in, uh, environment, in facing environmental uh, crisis and disasters. And I'm very happy that we can have this conversation with uh, uh, Rob Nixon. Uh, and Bart will be doing a formal presentation, but I want to say how important your, your work is in this building, how much, how present it is in the syllabi of many of the courses, and how many people here, students and faculty, are discussing, for instance, slow violence the environment, and environmentalism of the poor, and what it means, the notions of times that you bring into to understanding the built environment, and, and definitely Samia Henny, which I feel is very much in conversation with your work as well through the uh, question of the architecture, the, Fre the, archi the French architecture of uh, 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 radi radiation, and of course something that resonates also with the work of many people here, like Margot Suta, that I'm seeing here also being part of these sessions, and, and the very recent work on deserts are, are, the book, Deserts Are Not Empty, that Samia edited also here with Columbia uh, Books. I'm incredibly happy that Reinhold Martin and Keller Sterling are with us being part of this discussion. Of course, their work are deeply connected to this, and uh, I feel that also you two are already in conversation with Rob Nixon mm -hmm. and, and Samia Henny. And without more, I, I invite everyone to take notes. This is meant to be a conversation, and that's why we're staging it like this circle. And I would like to ask you, everyone, to, to really think what is the way that you would like to contribute to the debate afterwards. Okay, welcome everyone and welcome back, I should say, um, to what is the first affirmation of this <coughs> new year. And we're incredibly excited to have Samia Henny and Rob Nixon join us tonight together with Keller Easterling um, and Reinhold Martin, who will deliver the um, first questions and response. Um, uh, Samia had to switch to a remote presentation, so she's not here on stage with us, as you can see, but she's very much present uh, and will be part of the discussion and join us uh, via Zoom. Um, and as always, I want to welcome not only you of, uh, present in the room, but also all of you who join us remotely on GSEP YouTube channel, and especially also the members of our planetary cohort of respondents who are, as in the previous five uh, affirmations, joining us across many different uh, continents and time zones. So good night, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you. Um, my name is Bartjan Polman. I'm the Director of Exhibitions and Public Programming here at GSEP. Um, and the intention of this series or this uh, project, I should say, which we call Affirmations, um, is to develop a platform for discussions that are transdisciplinary, <coughs> engaged with all aspects of the built environment, um, and crucially, understand the built environment, um, not through isolated or autonomous objects, but rather as operating at the intersection of multiple networks, ecosystems, scales, and especially pertinent, um, I would say, in the, the context of the incredible work um, of tonight's speakers across multiple temporalities as well. Um, and as the title suggests, this series is meant to affirm possibilities, possibilities for ecosystems, societies, and worlds to come, discussed through the built environment and as emerging um, from the ruins of manifold contemporary crises and violences, as emerging from the cracks in the structures of power built on the interdependency of carbonization, extractivism, colonization, 
racialization, anthropocentrism, inequality, patriarchy, and technocracy. Um, and it is a project that therefore should also really be seen in its, or understood rather in its totality. And just to illustrate that, um, I want to recall here uh, the very first session we had with Olalikan Jefus and TJ Demos on radical futurisms um, in which the politicization of time played such a crucial role. Um, and in their futurisms, Olalikan and, and TJ radically um, sort of rejected the privileged access to hegemonic time um, and the urgent need to articulate new forms of solidarity, which Demos then, following Angela Davis um, and Marx, called an ecology of connectedness. Um, and for tonight's speakers, um, in different ways, uh, the notion of time is also crucial. Um, for example, in what, what Samia calls the, um, the long-standing temporality of colonial toxicity, um, which operates alongside the violent spatiality of France's colonial project in the Sahara, including the testing of France's first atmospheric bombs. Rob Nixon, in his seminal book, um, Slow Violence, calls for the need to recognize, and I quote, a different kind of violence, a violence that is neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but rather incremental and accretive, its calamitous repercussions playing out across a range of temporal scales. End of quote. Um, understood spatially, as we are in a school of architecture um, and planning, such as slow violence often amounts to what Nixon called, uh, calls uh, displacement without moving. Um, and Nixon offers a clear distinction between a, a media-savvy um, spectacular time and an unspectacular time for which it is much harder to get media attention, in part because it lacks the spectacle, but also, and this is crucial, because it operates across a multitude of skills ranging from the cellular to the transnational. And it's precisely this aspect of Nixon's work that um, Samia Henney highlights in the introduction to her book, uh, Deserts Are Not Empty, in order to show um, how difficult it is to maintain media attention um, to the various temporalities of coloniality and toxicity. So that's why I think it's so great to, to have both of them uh, speak together here today, because both operate also, I would say, as writer activists, uh, a public role whose important is, oh, importance is, is carefully emphasized and unpacked by Nixon in his work um, in and beyond the ecological humanities, mm -hmm. um, and because both fundamentally deal with the question of who counts as a witness um, in regimes of slow violence in which the production of toxicity is, is embedded in the mechanisms of coloniality, um, environmental depths are spatialized, and a locked door, as, as mm -hmm. Rob Nixon uh, mentioned, a locked door uh, can be a weapon. Um, so we will start with a talk by uh, Rob, followed by Samia. Um, and as I mentioned during uh, prior affirmations, this is not a lecture or, or two lectures followed by a panel. Affirmations wants to be a planetary conversation, so the presentations will be brief. Uh, and we'll have a response first from, from Keller and then from Reinhold um, before we open it up to the audience and the planetary cohort. And we'll end around 8.15, 8.20 um, New York time. So now for the formal introductions, um, Rob Nixon is a nonfiction writer and scholar and the Barron family professor in the environmental humanities at Princeton University. He has published four books, most recently Slow Violence, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor. Um, and his book, uh, Blood at the Root, Environmental Martyrs and the Defense of Life is, coming, is forthcoming um, from University of Chicago Press. Nixon writes frequently for the New York Times and his writing has also ap appeared in the New Yorker, the Atlantic Monthly, the Guardian, the Nation, the London Review of Books, the Village Voice, and elsewhere. He has been the recipient of an NEH fellowship, a MacArthur Foundation fellowship, a Guggenheim one, which he declined, um, <laughs> and you have been awarded residencies at a number of artist colonies, and uh, much of his writing engages uh, environmental justice struggles um, in the Global South. Um, Samia Henny is a historian of the built, the destroyed, and the imagined environments. Uh, she's the author of the multi-award winning Architecture of Counter-Revolution, the French Army in Northern Algeria, uh, and Colonial Toxicity, Rehearsing French Radioactive Architecture and the Landscapes in the Sahara. Um, she's the asset editor of Deserts Are Not Empty, and she's also the maker of several exhibitions, including perform Performing Colonial Toxicity, which is currently on view at uh, Framer Framed in Amsterdam, for, for those of you who are around, um, and then will travel afterwards. Um, her teaching and research interests, as well as her exhibitions, are centered around the intersection of architecture with questions of colonization, displacement, gender, resource extraction, and wars. And currently, she is an invited visiting professor at ETH in Zurich. And this summer, um, Samia will join the faculty of McGill University School of Architecture in Montreal. 
Uh, we're also incredibly happy to have Keller Easterling uh, here, who needs a little introduction, uh, but is a designer, writer, and the Annette Storm Dwyer Professor of Architecture at Yale University. She's the author of many, many books, uh, including the most recent Medium Design and Extra Statecraft, which I both highly recommend. Um, and Easterling lectures and exhibits internationally, um, and her research was included in the 2014 <coughs> and 2018 uh, Venice Biennials, among many ox uh, other exhibitions, and I also, I want to highlight the, the, the new project of Trustlands, which he recently um, presented at EFLUX. Um, very much looking forward to how that develops. Um, and Reinhold Martin is a historian of architecture and media, a professor here at GSEP and chair of Colombia's Committee on Global Thought. An author of numerous books, uh, Martin has studied the material and cognitive infrastructures of cultural, technological, and political economic modernity. Um, and he was also a founding editor of the interdisciplinary journal Grey Room. And uh, before we want to get started, I quickly want to thank uh, Lola Benalon and the Natural Materials Lab for producing these incredible uh, stools for the series that are made of a sort of 3D printed um, natural fibers. Uh, and I want to thank Clarissa Figueredo, um, who is helping us sort through the multiple questions from the planetary cohort, and Callum McGregor Koche um, and Arisa Nakamura, who will help facilitate um, questions from, from the audience. So, with that, let's get started. Great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Andres and uh, Bart, for setting this up. And I'm very grateful to, to Keller and Reinhardt for, particularly at the beginning of the semester, <laughs> agreeing to um, be respondents. Uh, and, and I'm grateful, too, to Lucy and Chris and everybody else in the team who have made this event possible. So I hope I will have enough affirmation in the cracks. Um, but uh, it's, it's a very... Um, iconoclastic series and I, I really am intrigued by the format um, and fascinated by um, the, the, the generative uh, fields that you're bringing together. So I thought what I'd do, it, you know, it's, it's, it can be a strange thing going back to, to, to a book and what I thought I'd do was to do something which I didn't do in the book which was to think through the visualization of slow violence. So the book, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, was very much focused on the figure of the, the literary witness, um, people working in the, in the cusp between social movements and uh, literary testimony, particularly nonfiction. And so what I thought I'd do today is just uh, reflect on a few images where I feel like the relationship between um, dramatic event the violence of dramatic event versus the violence of slow process um, is, is uh, addressed by different uh, visual artists. Uh, so, uh, slow violence is a violence that occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space, an attritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all. So primarily in the book, I'm addressing it in terms of climate breakdown, thawing glaciers, oil spills, toxic drift, radioactive aftermaths of war, acidifying oceans. But it clearly is applicable also to domestic violence. Um, um, if we think also of, say, football and soccer stars, um, players uh, who have serial head injuries, concussions and that, cumulatively, um, that uh, makes them more uh, prone to various forms of dementia and so forth. Uh, so people have also used that concept in, in that kind of context. Every inhabitant of this planet must contemplate the day when this planet may no longer be inhabitable. While that quote has a, has a contemporary resonance, it was actually JFK in 1961. And what he was referring to was this, uh, which is the you know, charismatic uh, mushroom cloud. Uh, if we think back to 2003, Condoleezza Rice saying, if we don't invade Iraq, we can expect the spectacle of the mushroom cloud hanging over America. So it was a very readily invoked um, uh, image of conflagration. And so in contrast to that, if we think of that as the, as the primary kind of cataclysmic fear in the second half of the 20th century, in the first half of the, or the first quarter of the 21st century, if we think of climate breakdown as the, the paradigmatic or most uh, prominent fear, uh, it is a much more diffuse 
uh, notion of, of calamity or uh, apocalypse. Uh, it's, it's both uh, dispersed in its impacts over space and dispersed in its impacts over time. So if we think of, say, uh, both climate breakdown and more broadly environmental toxicity, what we're typically looking at is something closer to this, uh, which is, if you recall, in the 2010 Deep Horizon oil spill, um, Corexit was sprayed at night over the, uh, the oil spill in an attempt to degrade it. And Corexit is a highly toxic substance that has been banned in the EU for a very long time. And so in the top left corner, you can see the, the sort of uh, raspberry colored um, area. And that's where the Corexit and the oil have bonded. And, and the point about Corexit was not that it would um, reduce the toxicity of the oil, but that it would lower it in the water so it was no longer visible. So the primary function of it was actually to reduce visibility. So this is the first phase and then it sinks. Um, so we can, we, we can contrast that with, with, say, the image of the Deep Horizon rig exploding, uh, the conflagration uh, that, that set off that, which killed, I think, 17 people, uh, rig workers. But the long durée of the aftermath uh, was compounded, actually, by the, by the um, toxicity. So in 2001, BP changed its logo uh, to the Sunburst logo, uh, and it declared that it was no longer British Petroleum, it was now Beyond Petroleum. So there was a very uh, concerted image on the part of the corporation to uh, green. It's, it's, uh, there was a futuristic greening of, of, of the corporation, which didn't last very long. Um, but in the context of the Gulf oil spill, this was one of the, the works that, that came up using the, the backdrop of the, uh, the sunburst uh, and then alluding to Eddie Am Adams' famous image from uh, the Vietnam War where um, a South Vietnamese uh, general uh, executed a Viet, Viet Cong captive. Uh, and so here what we have is, is both uh, an image of complicity uh, at, at the gas pump that we're, we're implicated in this and also an incredible uh, compression of the temporal effects of uh, uh, extreme petroleum uh, dependence. Uh, so there's a temporal compression and also an attempt to accentuate the violence or if you like gather together the violence into a single event. So the process becomes refigured um, as an event. So how have, how have different artists and filmmakers addressed this question of uh, the, the, the violence of the long durée uh, in, in aesthetic terms? So one example that stood out for me was Josh Fox's uh, film on the rise of uh, fracking, uh, Gasland. Uh, and what he did was he went around uh, from, from Wyoming to Texas to Pen Pennsylvania, various other states, and got uh, local people to take a lighter to the faucet. Uh, and so uh, this is what resulted. And the, the film is studded with these images. It's really the, the primary visual effect that we take away from the film. Uh, clearly, um, combustible water is never a good look, uh, particularly when it's in something as quotidian as the uh, as a kitchen tap. Uh, so again, I think th there's something uh, very invisible about uh, uh, the threat posed by by um, hydrofracking, uh, but also, in particular, what is invisible are the, the, the chemical cocktails that seep into the aquifer itself and then re-emerge through the faucet. So going from fire to ice, uh, this was at uh, COP21. Uh, so we had a, a, an artist and a geologist collaborating on Ice Watch. Uh, so it has a double valence. Uh, the a section of a, a small piece of a glacier was uh, transported to Paris from Greenland and carved up into these segments in the shape of a watch. So 
uh, obviously in the more temperate climate of Paris, uh, these um, ice residues melted very quickly. So you have uh, an acceleration of the process of ice loss, and you also have the image of the clock of, of time running out. Uh, similarly, with the uh, double valence, also from, from COP21, uh, uh, the sculpture, ice sculpture of a polar bear, um, was a way of alerting people to the endangerment of polar bears as sea ice melted, but also given that the sculpture itself started rapid, uh, rapidly melting, um, it, it sort of references the medium as endangered as well. So ice itself is endangered. Uh, and so you have an interdependence between the, the threat to the polar bear and the threat to the ice uh, flows and ice sheets on which they're dependent. Uh, so we could say, you know, is the sixth extinction a kind of slow violence? And various people have written about it, have written in these terms, if we think of uh, Tom von Duren writing about the dull edge of extinction or Mira Subramanian, extinction as whispering death. Uh, it's one of the paradoxes of this extinction that it's extremely consequential, but it's, it's very often only realized retrospectively when people look and look for a creature and can no longer find it. Um, so extinctions are, are silent um, and attritional uh, and both eventful and low in, in drama, if you like, or, or, or um, very hard to turn into spectacle. So I in Slow Violence and Environmentalism of the Poor, I had a, a section in the beginning on the Anthropocene, which at that point was just really uh, an emergent paradigm but now is, is a kind of a pervasive uh, set of uh, structures of thought. Uh, and so I thought I'd revisit that in relation to some Anthropocene-oriented uh, artists, uh, particularly Jason de Keres Taylor, and this series of his, underwater series, is called The Anthropocene. Uh, and so, in this particular image, you've got a very ambiguous figure here. It's hard to tell whether this uh, figure is, is, is in grief, is sleeping, uh, whether there's been a collision, whether they're uh, hiding their eyes in order not to see what's happening. Um, and to me, it's a, it's a kind of a visual reference or a visual allusion to Pompeii, where you had the... Um, the, the freezing of time of the human torsos in their, of people in their final activities. Now, obviously, in the case of a volcanic explosion, you've got um, both extreme visibility and extreme suddenness. And so, in the Jason de Keres Taylor instance, what you have here is a visual sleight of hand because uh, the, 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 the car crash, if you like, uh, caused by our um, uh, carbon-dependent, uh, CO2-dependent uh, cultures, um, is actually uh, is a nutritional process. And so, with, the, with this particular figure, um, there would be biological decay, not the kind of uh, petrif uh, petrifaction that you get in the in the Pompeii example, so these are happening at very different speeds. But uh, what I see Jason Keres Taylor trying to do here is to say, let's condense this in temporal terms and try to make this image of uh, calamity uh, clearly dramatized. Now, in a later image from that same series, um, he has these two figures looking down at the vehicle, uh, and you know, they're cl clearly scuba divers, but they have a kind of an, um, uh, an otherworldly force. And so I read the distance between those surface figures and the car um, as a temporal distance, not just a, a, a spatial distance. So they're like observers um, from the future looking at the future, uh, at, the, at the future remains that we are currently constituting through our consumerism, through our actions. Um, and so he's using the light, the surface light, 
to create a kind of a transcendent aura as well. And, and uh, they have a, a, an, an almost angelic, I think, uh, resonance. And it, it called to mind for me uh, Walter Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy, ninth thesis on the philosophy of history, where Benjamin writes, where we perceive a chain of events, the angel of history sees one single catastrophe that keeps piling ruin upon ruin and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. The storm is what we call progress. Um, and so, to, to me, that was very redolent of this image of the storm of progress as a cumulative phenomena, uh, the chain of events that is perceived as a single catastrophe. Um, uh, so, just before the Copenhagen um, COP summit, uh, the, the pre then president of the Maldives, uh, Mohammed Sh Nasheed, did this bit of uh, sort of underwater theatre uh, where he had. Uh, so, the Maldives, the highest point in the Maldives is like seven foot. So, this is one of the uh, island nations that is um, in the front line of disappearing, uh, possibly by around two. 2070 by current predictions. Uh, and so, you know, it's a small island with, with nation with very little international resonance, uh, but also uh, a, 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 an island state that has been traumatized by the prospect of inundation. So what he does here is, is in a kind of a theatrical way, uh, uh, you, uh, uh, he assembled his cabinet in the scuba ge gear and uh, they signed into law uh, a commitment to being carbon neutral within 10, de 10 years. Um, but you can see the sort of the gothic hair using the, 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 the pull of the water um, and the idea of um, inhabiting 2050 or 2070 uh, and trying to give our current actions a retrospective ethical and political force. Uh, now, as with the uh, Jason de Keres Taylor figure on the car, here there is a there's a kind of a sleight of hand because for all of these low-lying island nations, they're going to become uninhabitable through salinity before they become uninhabitable through disappearance or inundation. Uh, so basically, the, the the salt water rises or either pollutes the aquifer or um, pollutes. Uh, it salinates areas there where, where crops are grown, and so it becomes uninhabitable before it disappears. But it's the disappearance that is the dramatic act. I mean, that's, the, that's what uh, can help create a sense of, of emotional urgency. Salination is a much more difficult thing, I think, to animate in this way. So, with the movement for black lives and uh, the, the COVID pandemic, there w in, b in both those instances, a really strong focus on breath. Uh, and the thing about breath is that it is um, highly symbolic. You know, people talk about somebody sucking the oxygen out of a room, um, and I can't breathe is a dead metaphor brought to life um, by the movement for black lives. Um, but also, it's a matter of great physiological urgency. So we breathe 25,000 times a day. Um, all of us have had some experience of gasping or of feeling threatened, uh, ha having our breath threatened. Um, uh, and so this particular, um, the physiology of breath, the, the police politics of breath, and also um, the, the question of air pollution, uh, in some sense, converge. Now, this is an image from uh, a protest uh, by students at uh, Peking University well before COVID. Uh, and the, the mask was being used in, in various art forms. 
as a protest against the, the terrible quality, a uh, virtually unbreathable quality of uh, Beijing air at the time. Uh, and so here, the mouth is, is both the aperture through which we breathe, but also the aperture through which we speak. And so the X over the mouth, um, and interestingly, some on the right uh, use similar iconography during um, the, 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 the anti-vaxxers. We're using similar iconography during the COVID crisis, but this was pre-COVID. Um, and so it was a protest both against censorship and against um, unbreathable air. And it reminded me of this uh, photograph uh, from the early days of COVID in one of these makeshift uh, um, medical camps um, where you had this plastic drop cloth, in this case, separating a daughter from her mother um, uh, dur during the height of COVID. Uh, so the mask becomes a surface of protest and it has this multivalent um, dimension to it. And what's interesting about uh, I Can't Breathe is even though um, Black Lives Matter as a, as, a, as a rallying cry, as a slogan, circulated very widely internationally, um, I Can't Breathe and We Can't Breathe circulated even more broadly uh, into places where there are very few black people, for instance. And so whether you're in Delhi or Cairo or Jakarta, um, there was a lot of street art around of people identifying uh, with this um, particular rallying cry. So this is from the Indian magazine Outlook. Uh, this is uh, George Floyd uh, in the West Bank on the separation wall there. Uh, and this is uh, uh, from uh, Cape Town uh, on, the, on the highway that connects um, the Cape Town airport where all the tourists come in and the, the central city. And on that highway, um, the municipal government had built these walls uh, purportedly to prevent uh, drunk inhabitants from crossing the highway and getting hit. Um, but you have these favelas or, or shanty towns on either side of the wall. I mean, on, on, on both sides of the highway, you have these walls. And so this work of street art had a variety of resonances. Uh, you had the pollution coming from the, the he heavily used highway itself. Uh, you have very close to the shanty town uh, a huge coal-fired plant. So that was also contributing to very high asthma rates and um, unbreathable air. Uh, and as in so many poor communities around the world, there was also uh, asphyxiating policing. So very, very uh, brutal policing of the poor on the outskirts of the city. So I wanted to close with this image, uh, again, an Anthropocene image uh, by the Spanish muralist Sam Three. Um, and to me, this, this really is a, a very condensed image of the percolation of slow violence over time. So you have a surface act of tree felling or deforestation, um, and you have the percolation of the impact down through the body of time, which is also the, the living body of the land itself, through the, um, uh, the aorta of the land, if you like. Uh, and there's also the sense in which it's the, it's the social body, uh, which is not separate from the ecological body. Uh, and, and crucially here, and I think very effectively, we have a sense of the continuity of the life of the forest and the life and, and the human form, the torso beneath, so that um, deforestation is represented as self-decapitation, as a, as a kind of uh, species suicide. Um, but so anyway, those are, those are some samples of the ways in which um, visual artists have tried to condense time in order to heighten the, the violent element uh, within it. Thank you. Yes, can you hear me? Eh?
Yes, mm. yeah, we can hear you. Yes, okay, yeah. okay, yes, okay, just to confirm. Thank you so much. So hello, um, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to be part of this conversation with Rob Nixon, whose work um, has been inspirational. Um, thanks to Andres, Bart, Lucille, Keller, Reinhold, and all the individuals who were and are involved in this um, event. I think what you did, Bart, uh, in the introduction makes a lot of sense, and I will reiterate um, this connection also with Rob's um, work. What I would like to do is to practice the objective of this lecture series, affirmation, and thereby I will affirm the ramifications of climate colonial, climate slash colonial, for me they are very much related, regimes in historic and contemporary terms. I will affirm it through colonial toxicity and its performativity in the present times in the Sahara and around the world. I will also ask ourselves to pause and think about a few ethical questions, such as why we failed and keep failing to oppose colonialism and the killing of human and non-human lives. I will do so through the practice of rehearsing. The term comes from the 13th century old French, rehercier, which means literally to rake over, turn over the soil ground, to drag trail on the ground, be dragged along the ground, to rake harrow land, rip, tear, wound, repeat, rehearse. Thanks to Annick Fourier from If I Can Dance who reminded us of this definition. I must affirm and rehearse today because I believe that we cannot afford ethically, humanly, socially, economically, legally, and environmentally to remain silent, to support censorship, to back the suspension, suspension of anti-colonial and anti-war associations, including student associations, watch the killing of thousands of humans in Gaza, continue to pretend to pretend advocating for justice without justice, decolonization without decolonization, and to pretend promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion without diversity, equity, and inclusion. I could then this act, including the recent reported spraying of toxic chemicals on protesters at Columbia University a few days ago. What a violent world we keep experiencing. I'm speaking here as an anti-colonial scholar and as a human being with basic ethical values, as well as someone who was the subject of bodily experiences of hate crimes in the US. I believe that we are all responsible and that people will not forget. Bart talked about the notion of witness. I think this is very important for me as well. So to do so, I will move between different times and spaces. I will use images from my recent book, Colonial Toxicity, that Bart uh, mentioned, and also images from the exhibition Performing Colonial Toxicity. Everything is related and I will make it, or I will try at least to make it clear. I will end with a voice that reiterates that people will not forget. Colonialism is toxic. This toxicity is anthropogenic, human-made. It is irreversible, enduring, and destructive. It has far-reaching and long-lasting consequences. This manuscript rehearses fragments of these consequences called colonial toxicity. It focuses on the specialities and temporalities of the French nuclear weapons program in the colonized Algerian Sahara during and after the Algerian Revolution or the Algerian War of Independence that happened between 1954 and 1962. France's atmospheric and underground nuclear bombs were detonated in the Sahara between February 1960 and February 1966. It didn't stop in 1966 since, as uh, Rob mentioned, with this notion of sl slow violence, with the temporality of toxicity, it continued and it's still 
contaminating the lives uh, of humans and uh, non-humans in the Sahara. To carry out its confidential nuclear uh, weapons program, the French colonial regime built two military bases in the Algerian Sahara, the CSEM, the Saharan Center for Military Experiences in Ergen, approximately 1,150 kilometers south of Algiers, and the CIMO, or the Oasis Military Testing Center in Inukar, about 600 kilometers southern of Algiers. Whereas the CSEM was designed to host 10,000 civil and military personnel expected to work on the detonation and measurements of atmospheric nuclear bombs, the CIMO was conceived for roughly 2,000 people and for the underground atomic bombs. An estimated 20,000 20, people, civil and military, have worked or served in the Sahara nuclear ba bases between 1960 and 1966. It is unclear whether the Saharan people who worked on the construction of the CSEM and the CIMO and the firing tunnels are included in this estimation. However, the French colonial regime estimated that a sedentary population of 40,000 lived in the, in the area where the atmospheric bombs were detonated. They mainly occupied the oasis of Regen and the Tuet Valley north of Regen. In this estimate, there is no mention of the nomadic and semi-nomadic population of the Algerian and other parts of the Sahara. The atomic bombs spread radioactive fallout across Algeria, Central and West Africa, and the Mediterranean, including Southern Europe, and caused irreversible contamination. Whereas the word speciality refers to the territories, places, and spaces above and below the ground of colonial toxicity, the term temporality points to the status of their existence over time, in the past, present, and future. The book offers abundant visual um, evidence and that cannot and should not be overlooked or unseen. It priorizes, prioritizes images over texts, making the images portray the production and propagation of radioactivity and exposes the special effects of France's nuclear bombs program in the Sahara, whose institutional archives are still classified. The historical details and ongoing impacts of this nuclear history remain largely unexposed, tenaciously hidden by the French state behind the a wall of red ink, top secret stamps. The official archives is those, mostly marked by its holes, breaks, and absences. The visuals and the stories they carry form a reproducible corpus of some of the French military silenced records whose devastating health, special and environmental consequences are no secret. But if we all agree that these consequences are devastating, how come that some of us cannot call for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza? How come that some of us cannot stand for human rights, international law, special and environmental justice? The devastating health, special, economic, social, psychological, and environmental consequences of the bombing of Gaza are no secret. We see them every day and every night. Some of, the, some of us look away, some of us ignore them, some of us avoid them, some of us lie about them. Some of us justify them. There is no justification to colonial toxicity. There is no justification to bombing cities and territories and killing civilian human lives. There is no justification to violence. To oppose and expose colonial toxicity, I have conceived the exhibition Performing Colonial Toxicity, it was first presented at Framer Framed in Amsterdam between October 7, 2023 and January 14, 2024. It will travel to any institution interested 
in it until the French and Algerian governments will be forced to decontaminate the radioactive sites and affirm their complicity in colonial toxicity. Between brackets, next stops will be London and Zurich, both opening in March. Produced in collaboration with If I Can Dance, I Don't Want to Be Part of Your Revolution, the exhibition creates a series of audiovisual assemblage which trace the special atmospheric and geological impacts of French atomic bombs in the Sahara, as well as its colonial vocabulary and the afterlifes of its radioactive debris and nuclear wastes. Taking on an architectural scale, these stations, as I refer to them, are meant to be moved through and engaged with. Visitors are invited to draw their own connection between what is present in the, in the installation as well as what is absent from it. Experimenting with different modes of specializing and circulating suppressed information, the project three-part structure, the book, exhibition, and testimony, constitutes a call to action to open the still classified archives and to clean the dec and decontaminate the sites both crucial steps for exposing the pasts, presents, and futures of colonial toxicity. It, shed light, it sheds light on the redacted history of French nuclear colonialism in the Algerian Sahara and draws attention to the urgency of reckoning with this history and its lived environmental and socio-political impacts. It also engages with opposing colonial vocabulary, voc vocabularies and with naming radioactive matters and wastes. Colonial vocabularies belong to what Roland Bart, French literary theorist, linguist, and semiotician, has called écriture cosmétique, cosmetic writing, whose scope is not to communicate, but rather to intimidate. As illustrated in Architecture of Counter-Revolution, cosmetic writing is an integral part of the colonial project. In 1957, during the infamous Battle of Algiers, where liberation fighters were tortured and kill, killed, Roland Barthes published a book titled Mythology, Mythologies. In his chapter titled Grammaire Africaine, African Grammar, Barthes argued that the official terminology that the colonial representatives used during the Algerian Revolution or the Algerian War of, of Independence belonged to the semantic category of cosmetic writing, a mask that was designed to divert attention from the nature of the war and cover the real facts with the a noise of language. According to Bart, this grammar was both ideologically burdened and politically loaded. In this context, he, divine, he defined the term war as follows, and I'm quoting, war, the aim is to deny the thing. For there are two ways, either to name it as little as possible, the most common method, or to give it the meanings of its own antonym, a more devious method, which is the basis for almost all of the mystifications of bourgeois language. War is then used in the sense of peace and pacification in the sense of war. This practice of denying the thing or giving it the meaning of its antonym is thriving in this game, in these days. Again, when it comes to the bombing of Gaza, the destructions of homes, schools, universities, hospitals, libraries, archives, cemeteries, and so on. The evidence is there. Why can some of us not name it? Why are some of us so afraid of denouncing colonial oppression? Why have some of us failed to make colonial and imperial institutions accountable for the contaminations of territories, including their waters, plants, and air, and for, killing, of, for the killing of lives and the destruction of cities? To oppose colonial vocabularies imposed by the French colonial state, we created the Testimony, Testimony Translation Project, managed by Megan Hutcher from If I Can Dance, 
It consists of a selection of victims and survivors' testimonies that were made digitally available in their original language, Temezir or French, as well as in the translation or English translations. And here, I want to thank um, all the people who are listed here on this slide who uh, have been crucial in helping in translating uh, the testimonies from, from uh, French uh, into English. This is really a collaborative project and it, this project would not have been possible without their crucial support. The witnesses, the witness accounts span a range of voices, including Algerian voices from Saharan inhabitants that worked at either the atomic base in Ergen or in Nikke, or from their extended families and communities network, as well as French voices, military and civil personnel stationed in one of the two French bases. The testimonies of the victims who lived in the Sahara or worked for the French army from, co covered numerous topics, including the working conditions, contract terms, lack of protection during and after the detonation of the nuclear bombs, lack of information about the impact of the atomic weapons, diseases and symptoms that they are suffering from, memories of the explosions, dangers they faced after the explosions, the invisibility of radioactivity, lack of trust in the French and Algerian authorities, arable lands that had been or become unproductive, widespread infertility in the region, lack of medical follow-up, living and with fear and death. The, the voices and bodies, the lives and deaths of Algerian workers were excluded from the news broadcasted released by the French after the detonation of the first atmospheric bomb in 1960. The black and white moving images portrayed mainly French men wearing white suits, gloves, boots, and gas masks. The thousands of the Saharan people who helped produce the irreversible contamination of their own land without their knowledge and consent were deliberately erased from the histories, stories, and narratives about French colonial atomic weapons. The imposed amnesia, denial, and erasure of facts and events are part of what colonial regimes have been doing and are still doing today. Their aim is not only to control narratives and alter them, but also to spread misinformation. In the last few months, a number of organizations and individuals have repeatedly demanded to stop the misinformation of colonial and imperial regimes. A few months ago, architects and planners against apartheid called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, called to publicly condemn violations uh, of academic freedom and freedom of speech, and called on us to support students, faculty, and staff calls, letters, and educational program for justice and oppose retaliation, doxing, bullying, surveillance, and misinformation. These are basic ethical demands that should not be contested. The specialities and temporalities of colonial and climate regimes must be stopped. As Rob Nixon argued in his book, Slow Violence and Bart mentioned it in his introduction, I will just repeat it here for the sake of rehearsing, Maintaining media attention on the temporalities of toxicity is challenging. I quote, not only because it is spectacle deficient, but also because the fallout's impact may range from the cellular to the transnational, and depending on the specific character of the chemical or radioactive hazard, may stretch beyond the horizon of imaginable time. Victims, veterans, journalists, filmmakers, poets, writers, activists, and a handful of anti-nuclear politicians have revealed the imposed exposure of human lives and built a natural environment to radioactivity. After years of struggle and perseverance, the French authorities ultimately recognized their right and adopted the law, a law in, 19, uh, in 2010 on the recognition and compensation of the victims of French nuclear tests. However, the persons suffering from radiation induced pathologies must have resided or stayed 
and I am quoting here, either between 13 February 1960 or 31st of December 1967, uh, at the Saharan Military Experiment, uh, Experimentation Center, or between the 7th of November 1961 to the 31st of December 1966 at the CISEM, the Oasis Military Experimentation Center on the peripheral zones of these centers. The vagueness of the term peripheral zones is concerning especially to the size and direction of nuclear clouds, dust, and ashes. Moreover, this law does not recognize the temporality of radioactivity, the production of radioactive environments and landscapes, the nuclear wastes that the French left behind in the Sahara, and the unrestricted circulation of radioactive materials that the French authorities did not fully contain. To acknowledge this, or the acknowledgement of the scale, locations, and times of French exposure of, Algeri of the Algerian Saharan and African bodies, lives, and environments to radiation must be, must be revised and updated. Colonial toxicity is at once an assembly of images an assemblage of voices and a repository of sources. It is organized around specific themes that congregate, connect, relate, scale, and juxtapose various sets of visual accounts. The practice of searching, scanning, photographing, gathering, saving, assembling, indexing, arranging, and rearranging the visuals is a form of writing. It writes the production of radioactivity, it writes the causes of radioactivity. It writes the symptoms of radioactivity. It writes the effects of radioactivity. It writes the architecture of radioactivity. It also writes what the French authorities deem top secret. I would like to conclude with the testimony of Aisha. She did not forget what happened to her, her people and her land in the 1960s when the French detonated the French bomb close to her village called Mertutek in the Algerian Sahara without informing the people. She was 10 years old. She did not forget. She even said that this is the only story that she can tell. The deadly conditions of the population of the village of Mertutek and their animals and environment after the village was covered and surrounded by radioactive but by a, a radioactive cloud resulting from the bomb. The residents of this village are still suffering from the presence of radioactivity. They will not forget, and their bodies are carrying colonial toxicity and transmitting it to the future generations. <laughs> What <laughs> This <laughs> Good and
arnar maga hana bedagata hana qna intasadaga shka ni gasa yoda akitaba ma ma artijan intamatan tadiusen inna ni gas lazim tamatan tadiusen litramid lu sedid dunat di artam mutan hmm hmm dah syait تجاني اللي غور غور مراوت يعني مو سقط نوبي تغاز الضاع مو سقط مضان مو سقط مضان غور دي نغدي التلفاق توريار تمضان دي ديت كتوق يا وين دغي جني مدا كتوق ضاع نغول ليه نوخلاص فرد فنيا ولا انا غاي دغطا الكورة متفاد Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you, thank you, Samia, and thank you, Rob, for your uh, both of you for your presentations and also for your work at large that resonates on so many levels. Um, I would like to ask Keller to ask the first questions. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, it's been a and it's been a pleasure to go back to to reread your works, uh, Rob Nixon and Samia Henning, and, the, and maybe the responsible thing to do would, would be to um, ask a question that reflects the depth of that work. But I, I'm just too curious uh, to get your reflections about some other emergent forms of narrative. Um, mm. I mean, you've both found such vivid examples in narrative and media that that instantly uh, communicate the non-event, the invisible, the long temporal dimension, as well as as the depravity of some forms of, of structural and slow violence. Samia, you know, for you, this this colonial toxicity as multiple forms of invisibility is the thumping, you know, careless litter of nuclear experiments that are powerful enough to, to melt glass that are, you know, it, the same as hurling bombs in Gaza that are treated as if they're somehow just conveniently out of the dominant sight lines um, or that they're easily obscured with lies. Or Rob Nixon, you have, had, you know, have many uh, examples, Wagari Mangai, uh, Matai, uh, the Maldives underwater cabinet that you showed, the, the gas land um, uh, igniting the kitchen tap with a big lighter, or animal, um, animals, people, you know, the character for whom, for whom the passage of time doesn't provide any healing but provides fresh forms of misery. That's the way that time works. But <coughs> then again, after more than a decade of working with these ideas, and you know, your work and Samia, we've been thinking about these things uh, expressed in spatial languages, thinking about them as designers and, and practices. So I'm wondering if we're not at a, at a kind of multi-forked, uh, um, multi-pronged fork in the road with these narratives. Now, there's, first of all, the overwhelming sense that there's still 500 years of abusive uh, patterns of white modern enlightenment thinking that remain to be vividly exposed. Um, but in another persuasion, um, and I'm kind of following Olufemi Otaiwo here, might say that exposure is not enough. Uh, I mean, since these patterns of harm will only continue Ad addressing future climate threats is inextricably linked to redressing historic damage with reparations. That there's nothing but reparations. There's nothing but reparations that we're doing. Um, but are the narrative forms that are associated with our activism often only reproducing the dispositions of the last 500 years? Um, you know, if classic narratives linked persuasion and action with war, manifesto, revolution. What, what narratives do we have that aren't reproducing that same enlightenment thinking, but instead inspiring countless inconsistent, patchy, 
non-solutionist projects, powerfully multiplied gradients of change. I guess what I'm asking is, what is the utterly different shape of those narratives? You know, would they take the shape of, of some emerging planetary forms of sovereignty and, and solidarity that, that are both situated and atomized, you know, locally under siege like Palestine, like mm -hmm. Ukraine, but diasporatically linked to, to, to um, allies. Again, what is the utterly different shape of those narratives? And that's, that's enough of a difficult question, but I want to add one more prong to the, no, one more fork in the road. Um, and I want to ask, you know, what sort of narratives are not only exposing um, the blowback from uh, chemical atmospheres and invisible things, but are actually infiltrating the equally consequential political cl persuasions that are doubling down on their loyalty to abuse of power now. So our narratives inspire environmental activism that often speaks to the already persuaded with yet more nuance, yet more precise measurements of our doom. But might there be some brave and impure and, and sneaky efforts to de-radicalize the strong man cults of the far right? Um, you know, what, I mean, I, I went back to read um, um, Dream Birds, Rob Nixon's Dream Birds, you know, I could ask, you know, what, what are the wild stories that get ostriches mm -hmm. to Texas and Arizona? You know, mm -hmm. wh what are the historical and emergent rogues and, and picaros with the wiliness to upstage and draw attention away from, from political superbugs, Trump and Netanyahu, and mm -hmm. reduce their bulletproof violence the way they lie? <laughs> So, but give, and I just finally, you know, given our purest leftist sentiments, would we have the stomach or the courage for it? <laughs> okay, thanks. Samia, you want to respond first? <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, yeah, Keller, for the question. Um, yeah, I think um, maybe I, 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 I yeah, I, I can't really respond in a very general, yeah, it's not like a general recipe, I would say, but more uh, very specific way of acting when it comes to specific projects. I'm just right now thinking of the, you know, the, the book as a form of a repository, the exhibition as a form of experience Older, but also communication with the very general public, and the testimony is 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 really undeniable evidence. Is human beings speaking, um, and it can be shared, and it is shared. It's online. It's um, available to whoever has access to internet. So I'm I'm speaking like um, um, like um, literally and not theoretically. Really, like as as a way of acting within this kind of secrecy that the French created. Uh, the archives are still classified. So one of the questions that they had when they did not open the archives in 2020, when they were supposed to open them, is to ask how do we oppose and disobey to this imposed amnesia and this imposed um, secrecy which we know it's not secret because people are, are, are sick in, in the Sahara and in France and the territories are witnessing or are showing and demonstrating and illustrating all those toxic and radioactive landscapes and environment that the French left after they, they uh, moved their nuclear weapon program to the Pacific Ocean in 1966. So for me, the question was how, as a scholar, um, knowing that archives are classified and knowing that historians work on archives, we're right. Their history is based on archives. So how, my question was, how do we um, try to find other ways of knowing and other ways of uh, exposing and other ways of collaborating and trying to use what other people did before and also what people experienced to make this all not only uh, accessible to others through this 
repository, but also um, that can be reproduced. And this is exactly what the exhibition is doing, is to start produce it somewhere and then design it in a way that it can be folded and sent all over the place. And the aim or the objective or the hope and the wish is that the French and the Algerian government will act, meaning that they have to, or I, I hope that they will be forced um, to decontaminate the, the sites and to repair, to take care of the health of the people in the Sahara and in France. So it's really li literal, my response. Um, and I agree, it's, I think exposure is not enough. I think uh, reparation is needed, but to force that reparation, I think for me, that's the question, how do we get to the accountability of nuclear regimes uh, or even you know, colonial states? How, how do they take their responsibility and how do make how do we make them accountable for the deeds that, or the, 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 the traces that they left? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great uh, set of issues that you, you, you flagged. And so, you know, if there's slow violence, there's also slow resistance. And um, relative to what the period I was writing about in the book, um, which was, sort of mainly pre-digital, um, the, the very character, the technological character of our world has changed so much since then, uh, both in terms of the, the platforms available for representation and the constituencies you can reach through that, um, but also in terms of the uh, distribution, the uh, many organizations around the world uh, that have invested in distribution of technologies of surveillance and recording and data production and filming on the behalf of uh, environmental defenders on the front lines and on the fence lines where uh, people are most vulnerable. Uh, and so I see that as one of the, th the most promising uh, developments. Uh, so for instance, in the Amazon, um, indigenous uh, peoples uh, d during the Bolsonaro uh, period were widely using these technologies um, and producing data and um, uh, using it in, in the international context, in legal context and so forth, in trying to uh, document with a, a degree of texture and sophistication that was not possible uh, prior. Um, the other thing that I, I would I would say to your to your very resonant question is that I'm, I'm very interested in alliance building and the 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 contingencies that allow alliances to happen, uh, to form and then often uh, dissolve thereafter. But there are these possibilities and and. One of the things about what, what the anthropologist Anat Singh calls uh, traveling allegories is we don't know what nodal images and stories are going to facilitate change and bring people together. Um, you know, um, if, we, if we think of uh, Colin Kaepernick and taking the knee, you know, in the Premier League, which is the most watched sports league in the world today, each match still begins with uh, players taking the knee as a protest against uh, racism. So th the symbolic possibilities are very seldom realized at the moment of creation or invention. Similarly, you know, uh, Eric Garner saying 11 times I can't breathe, uh, an asthmatic man uh, being strangled, uh, that became a, a rallying cry and, and uh, you know, it's, it's not like people putting forethought into this. There is just a node and a possibility and sometimes it lands and sometimes it doesn't. But I'm, I'm very alive to the openness of the symbolic realm and the, the imaginative role uh, that artists and, and, you know, what are unfortunately called content providers sometimes uh, 
can can generate in in terms of just uh, putting something out there and not knowing who will congregate to it, not knowing how far geographically or in time that um, that image or that story will continue to to have a resonance. Uh, yeah. Reynolds, please. Yeah. Okay. Well, <coughs> you know, I have to say I feel a a little bit disarmed. Um, I would have offered a more or less formal academic response to the chapter uh, from Slow Violence that Rob circulated. I really would li still yeah, like to yeah, do yeah, that. Sure. Okay. Uh, but, yeah. you know, and, and Samia's article from Eflux, but I guess these guys haven't read or may not have read these, and so we're meant to have a conversation um, about sort of around these things. Uh, so to, to do that, I just wanted to see if we can kind of tighten up a little bit on some of the things we've been circling around already uh, and and begin by like imagining that we're not on TV here and and we're you know with Lola's lovely these are really cool mm. uh, and the tables but kind of the whole thing is over and we're like at a bar maybe mm. or a restaurant and 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 you know we don't we're not accountable in, in a sense to the theater and, and we're just kind of talking as honestly as possible. And so the question is, what is to be done? Mm. And, and it, I think, you know, we're already obviously circling around mm. this. But, but I, I pose that question in its classic political form uh, because in some sense, the corollary to, to, the, to the beautiful uh, forms of testimony, the evidence, the eloquence of your writing, the, the images that you've added now, to to our, um, our our kind of witnessing, and of course the horror that we've all been witnessing in Gaza, that 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 looms over all of this, uh, as we sit here, you know, helplessly and maybe a little parochially, uh, doing what we do, mm -hmm. uh, but the doing what we we do sometimes also, it takes these other forms, you know, and in which we 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 maybe, can maybe even. You know, discuss, and I, I suspect we might even disagree as to what is to be done um, when when the lights are off. Uh, so, so for example, the, it, it seems to me that 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 the scandal here. I, I, mean, I can't mm -hmm. I can't mm -hmm. stop I, thinking about the angel of history today, mm -hmm. uh, and the kind of bearing witness. This is what, of course, we're all talking about. But, but the the scandal is here is here maybe not so much that we don't know that that the archives have been closed the state has withheld evidence wi or the corporations have withheld evidence as in bhopal the the um that that you know the scandals that we know mm. yeah and 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 yet and so this is maybe i want to try and a little bit inject uh, to the extent that it's possible at the bar, and maybe you know, <laughs> there's something else in this class here. Mm -hmm. uh, a um, a sense of you know, we don't have time mm -hmm. uh, in any of this mm -hmm. with respect to any of these these uh, monstrosities uh, that we can to which we, in our comfort, continue to uh, bear witness as others die. So. So, uh, you know, maybe we can just uh, parse it just one more level mm -hmm. and distinguish to some extent. Uh, uh, Samia made, uh, I, I think, absolutely, you know, necessary reference to the ethical demands that are, that are you know, all of us in different ways, or uh, many of us at least, are making. And, but I want to ask what it might mean to turn those into political demands. Like, so, for example, what in a political sense a nonviolent end to slow violence might look like. Um, uh, or, and, you know, does it mean nationalizing the oil companies and shutting them down in that way? Does it, you know, what else? What, what, are, there, what are the options that are really on the table, kind of at the bar, uh, when the lights are off? So, mm. so that's pretty much all I have to ask. What is to be done in that, uh, you know, uh, sort of unavoidably and necessarily urgent sense um, without trivializing the subtleties and complexities that we've been discussing? Mm. So. Mm. Should I go first? No. <laughs> no, go, 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 Rob, Rob, go, go, Rob. <laughs> I, I can't read the body language, so please, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I think it's, it's a, yeah, I think it's a relevant question. Um, 
and I, I, I respond to it maybe in a very controversial way <laughs> and quoting, quoting Franz Fanon here, you know, for him, decolonization is the substitu substitution of a society with another society. We have not, we, we, we are not there. We did not substitute, substitute that society. Colonialism is still at stake. Colonialism is still operating all over the world. And it's not only about the occupation and the oppression and the physical occupation of uh, territories and societies, but it's also a psychological one, it's an environmental one, it's an economic one, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, as long as these forms of governance, of, of, of governance, so imperial and colonial governance, continue to operate in the ways that they operate, what can what is to be done? For me, it's the substitution of those modes of operation. We did not, we, it didn't happen, and I don't see it will happen in the very, very uh, near future. I think quite the opposite. So we don't have time, yes, but who is the we here? I think this is the biggest division that I'm seeing it right now. It's like for many people, they, they do have time because they don't care about not having the time. I leave it to you, Rob. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks. No, it's, it's, a very, it's a very important question, and I think that... Um, so if we think of neoliberalism as a, a sort of... A, colonialism in another guise. One of the, I mean, two of the things that are, are markers of neoliberalism, one is um, a concerted uh, attacks on and dismantling of regulatory regimes. Um, and uh, in addition to that, you have um, mega mergers of corporate mega mergers. So in the animals uh, people chapter, uh, you know, I talk about how um, Union Carbide disappeared um, uh, into Dow Chemical, and so by a two companies merging into two large companies merging into a mega company, uh, the uh, Dow Chemical, which absorbed Union Carbide, uh, absorbed the profits but not the responsibilities. So that they said, well, um, Union Carbide no longer exists, so the reparations for uh, the victims of the Bhopal disaster are not our problem. They are um, uh, Union Carbide's problem, and Union Carbide has evaporated. We saw something similar in Ecuador uh, with, the, again, the merger of oil corporations, and they t would take the profits but not the responsibilities for the the lasting effects um so that the 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 disparity in size and power but also the disparity in 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 social responsibility uh so i think that the the uh, even if we look at the crisis of democracy one of the legacies of uh, colonialism has been uh, that so-called independence often uh, arrived with the absence of a, uh, a, a civic society that w could um, uh, apply a break to militarization and autocracy. Uh, so if we think of the Belgian Congo, for instance, when the Belgian left, there were 17 university graduates in the entire country, okay? Uh, and so we see that over and over again in, in so-called um, decolonized countries is the, the militarization of power and the um, uh, assaults on already th threadbare uh, civic organizations of uh, freedom of speech, rights of assembly. We see it even in, obviously in this country, but even more acutely uh, elsewhere. So I think that... that uh, you know, part of the, 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 the political demand is, is for answer, answerability, uh, for regulatory uh, um, transparency, um, and to push back against something like um, uh, Citizens United, you know, and the, the corporate personhood, uh, which is uh, 
totally focused on the, the patent rights of the corporation and not on the health of the affected citizens. You know, I referred to the, the fracking industry and that's, that's become a, a classic site for this. Um, and so, you know, in the midst of the, the, in the midst of the genocide in Gaza, uh, one of the things that we're seeing is the relationship between um, the horrendous immediate toll and what we can't even bear to look at yet, the, the long-term effects of ecocide. Uh, of the munitions being used. And in Slow Violence, I, I have a, a chapter where I talk about depleted uranium and the integration of that into uh, uh, so-called conventional warfare. Uh, and that has a radioactive and a chemical threat that, that uh, lasts, uh, the radioactive threat for millennia. Uh, so I think that, that uh, part of the, part of the, the, the urgency is to address the immediate and also to spread awareness of the long term. Uh, for instance, there was, uh, has been some discussion in uh, uh, some Israeli political circles about flooding the tunnels with seawater, the salination of the tunnels, okay? So that might be presented as an immediate military strategy, but it would render the land uninhabitable in perpetuity. Uh, so is there anything more precious in the Middle East than aquifers, okay? Um, and so that is, a, that is a both a, 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 a uh, threat uh, to uh, Gazans, but a threat to people who may live there 500,000 years from now, you know? So I, th I think it's hard enough looking at the, looking at the, the immediate brutality, um, but there is also a, a, a moral and environmental imperative, I think, to talk about the, the tactics of war, the, the, the particular, um, you know, um, uh, munitions and uh, toxic uh, substances used in war, which increasingly I think what, what we would be pushing back against is, is uh, creeping militarization. And I think above all, if we look at what's going on in, in Gaza and Israel, the people who are applauding are the, um, the, the, military, uh, in, uh, the, the, the military industry, basically, the international military industry, so that countries like Germany, Denmark, etc., say, well, we have to take a lot of our social care budget, we have to cut that and beef up the military, okay? So that's, w above all, what I'm opposed to is the militarization of everything and um, recognizing that there are so many incentives for people to uh, take uh, uh, from already threadbare uh, social networks of support and care and transfer that to a very narrow idea of security narrow both in terms of strategy and narrow in terms of time. Thank you. Maybe this is um, a good moment to, to open it up to the audience. Are there any questions? see any questions maybe um, I can pose a question I'll start with with something from the the planetary cohort who have submitted several oh yes, um, questions in advance am I missing someone no right missing no no um, uh, basically several questions that were submitted in advance had to do um, uh, with with the sort of speciality of your work I think given the, the context of, of a school like this as well um, so I'm just um, repeating um, a question by Juan Jose, Jose uh, Sanchez Rivas from Madrid. 
who is wondering um, if it is possible to fight against the inequality created by this um, you know, slow violence um, with specific spatial strategies. Um, so spatial strategies as a, a form of resistance, I would, would, would say. And the other question is, is, about is from Emily, uh, Emeline uh, from uh, Providence, uh, Rhode Island, who is asking um, about proximity. How is proximity defined by military corporate or insurance interests um, and, and knowing the leakiness of, of, of sites of, of, of slow violence basically um, are there different ways to think about proximity so those are two, two sort of spatial questions that I wanted to point point out okay yeah um, so I think the, the spatial question uh, There are different forms of distance. So there's physical, geographical distance, there's temporal distance, and often they can both be used to outsource responsibility. Um, and that's so much easier to camouflage in uh, an era of where the, the power and mobility of mega corporations is so much greater than the power and the mobility of, of individuals. So one of the things that I've, I've, I've seen that's quite effective, and this is partly coming out of my new work on um, uh, environmental martyrs in the tropical forests uh, uh, that circle the midriff of the earth, um, is uh, the organizations, one would be uh, Not One More, which is, is a, attempted to reduce the number of um, Environmental defenders, something like 900 a year, who are assassinated each year, primarily in these tropical forests. Um, bringing people together from different social movements that have r roughly analogous experiences. So if you're a forest defender in the tropics and you're in Indonesia or Cambodia or Colombia or Brazil or um, Nigeria, you're going to have different political and legal landscapes that you're operating in. But many of the factors uh, that you face, the challenges you're facing, and the the strategies and technologies that you can use to defend yourself, are um, are roughly analogous or partly analogous. Um, and so I, I, I've been quite encouraged by some of those organisations that have used their resources not to just bring in experts, but to uh, have people in Brazil talking to people in. Uh, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo or Guinea-Bissau or Indonesia. Uh, and one of, the, one of the striking things about this is that um, I was talking to a friend who had organized one of these conferences and she said that 30% of their budget was for translators because there was no central language. It wasn't like English or Spanish or Portuguese. Mm -hmm. you could translate, you're translating among so many different languages. Now maybe with um, AI, this, these costs would come down. But she said what was so astonishing was for an international conference, uh, the translation costs were far higher than the airfares. Okay, which is and so the the fact is that the most vulnerable communities environmentally are, are very often from small linguistic groups, and so getting people together to to share strategies to. Um, Ex uh, bring together pro bono lawyers, bring together journalists um, and and um, and scholars with these people who have shared experiences across these front lines. I think is a very um, is a very positive way of using proximity uh, that that is 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 hard to come by for them, um, but also to. Uh, create conversations that are hard to have if they are, are typically refracted through an academic uh, occasion. Yeah. Samia, would you like to, to respond to these questions? The, the question of, of yes. proximity and, and spatial. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think um, the question of proximity Maybe I can start with the with the design. I think it's what architects and um, you know people who studied architecture and urban studies, uh, but specifically architecture and, and, and planning. I, I think we have this capacity to map 
I know it's obvious, but it's extremely important to try to map what cannot be mapped. You know, radioactivity is completely and also chemical toxicity. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's not visible to the human eye, but we need to find ways to represent it and to make it to map it. I think this is an extremely important way to keep or to try to maintain that media attention. I think the media attention here is not only with the newspaper, but it's with any kind of media. So we need to create those maps or the, we need to create those representations in order to speak about them and in order to name them because they are not visible to the human eye. I think this is for me very important and it cannot be done only like in, in one territory, it has to be done in a relational way because these kinds of radioactivity or these kinds of toxicity circulates around the world. There are no borders. It's uh, uh, So the question is how do we represent it and how do we make it, how do we map it so that we can see it, name it and talk about it, not only in the region, but also how it circulates. That's maybe the response on design and special practices and what's the role that we should have, I think, you know, I said we are all responsible, we will not forget. So we have agency, mm -hmm. very important that we use it. The question of proximity um, in the case of um, of the Algerian Sahara, I mean, you know, radioactivity is really traveling or occupying, inhabiting, if not colonizing the bodies of people. And it is transgeneration, transgenerational. So it's extremely uh, near, close to the body, if not it's in the body of the Saharan and also uh, people are also French veterans. And how do, how do we read? How do we speak? How do we even map that proximity? I think this is an another way or another um impossibility of representation you know it's circulating or it's occupying the their bodies their human bodies and they are transmitting those diseases and those that, that radioactivity that we don't know when uh, it radiates as well because uh, you know some of these particles are still circulating in the sahara so people can inhale it um, they can any time be contaminated and that kind of proximity for me it's always difficult to represent and we have to think about how do we represent it oh there is a question here please hi thank you thank you for the conversation uh, my name is anushka i i while i recognize sort of the hardness of asking for a solution. I'm curious about sort of repositioning that question that has been asked to think about sort of why it is that we are doing the work that we are doing here, uh, whether that relates to sort of research, but also sort of the practice of teaching. And I guess I'm sort of searching for some form of optimism related to where the way and the modes that we are being taught to think goes outside of sort of a room like this, or whether it's sort of a satisfaction with the recognition that it will remain on some form of margin somewhere, um, and sort of an attempt to sort of situate this type of work in the long history, but also sort of a long future of what comes next. and. How how this matters? Yeah. Why why Thank are you. we doing what we're doing? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the short answer. Uh, yeah. So uh, for me, sometimes it's less a question of hope than of strategy towards change. Um, that. We, we need to marshal hope, and we all need hope as a kind of a fuel for our existence. Um, but at the same time, I think, particularly in the US, the, there is, in, in, in films, books, and that, there's, there's sometimes an obligatory arc towards 
hope. And sometimes that can be genuine and uh, germane and integral. And sometimes it can be kind of tagged on as, uh, okay, the editor said we need a more hopeful ending kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and sometimes I feel more hopeful when the ending is more ambiguous. <laughs> and, and I don't feel put upon by that. Uh, but I think that w what I was describing earlier, where um, those of us who have resources use those resources to try to create uh, to, to create the conditions for conversations that are not happening or are very difficult to generate. I think that to me is a very essential um, dimension to holding on to the prospect of change, you know. Uh, and so, also, I think it's, it's so important to, whether we're talking about climate, we're talking about um, uh, the Middle East, to remember that change has happened in very profound and unexpected ways historically. And like every social movement that has been, that has made an impact, whether we're talking about suffragettes, anti-apartheid movement, civil rights movement, the movement for marriage equality, um, AIDS activism in, in the late 80s and 90s. Uh, every one of those movements um, were a mix of pessimism and optimism, you know. Uh, and certainly when I was growing up in South Africa, apartheid seemed written in stone, like People would say, well, history's not on the side, but if you looked around you, it was so difficult to see the mechanisms for change. And then certain things shifted. We had the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union in 89. Mandela freed from prison the following year. Um, and the divestment movement in the US contributed, trade union movement in South Africa. There were all these different forces that came together and suddenly there was a a tectonic shift in the political landscape. Uh, similarly, you know, having moved to the US in the 80s, uh, with the AIDS crisis, there was a time when people were profoundly pessimistic about the prospect of not only anti-retrovirals, which w w w were not even a figment of people's imagination at that point, but also of the vilification of queerness. It seemed like, again, like written in stone. And so we do see shifts that are often quite sudden and quite significant. And as we've seen with, with abortion, they are reversible. And I see this particularly with um, environmental uh, activism is that if there's a lucrative product in the ground, you can have a victory 30 years later Somebody else is trying to get that out, and you have to redo the, the struggle. You know, it's not, it's not victory or defeat. And every victory has elements of, of, of defeat within it, and I think every defeat also has the seeds of new initiatives and new possibilities. Um, yeah. Kara, did you want to respond? Uh, I did yeah. respond just uh, briefly just to underscore some things that have been said. Um, um, you know, if... You know, sometimes one thinks of a cultural narrative as, or, or a sort of popular cultural narrative as a novel or a film, or you know, you showed showed works of art, uh, visual art, and um, or one refers to sort of activist movements. But I'm but I'm wondering, you know, if you pose a question which says that that exposure is inextricably linked to reparations, then aren't some emerging narratives design stories, um, design narratives, some of what we do when we work outside of kind of the cul-de-sac of the discipline, um, cul-de-sac of the profession, I'll say, you know. Um, what, what, are, what are design narratives? How, how is that a different emergent narrative than some of those with which we're familiar? Or that are most popular? How, and how does it become a popular narrative? Samia? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe 
to respond to this question, like why are we doing the work or why are we doing what we are doing for me? Um, maybe it's banal, but I think because we are human beings living on this earth and we need, each of us need to do something. So we need to do this kind of work. But I would also like to invite you, the person who asked the question, can we ask the question differently? Can we say, can we maybe say that how can we see the work that we are doing as a possible contribution to the to the to the many actions and many practices that are being done uh, on this planet? Because I think it's not about a solution. There is no universal solution. There are many scales of contributing. And this is maybe the question of proximity or distance. Um, you know, the scales of contributing to a change or to strategy, to use Rob's uh, term, strategies, I would even say of existing, you know, we cannot not do anything. I think we are hopeful, we are very optimistic because we are doing the work that we are doing. So how do we think of the different scales that one, with which one could contribute? And here I'm not speaking only about the scale, the special scale, but also the temporal scale and the institutional scale. I think institution in this kind of, optimistic or um, productive contribution, I think is really relevant. I think this is a great point to, to stop. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and Reinhold, I, I wish I was, I, I was there with you in the bar to speak about uh, <laughs> the You know, come on over. <laughs>